big win last night in Singapore, not just for President Donald Trump, but for the United States and the entire world. I could not be prouder today of our President Donald Trump, prouder to be an American and prouder to live in an America that, again, leads from the front. Of course, I'm talking about the historic summit in Singapore that took place last night, this morning, Singapore time, last night, our time here on the East Coast, at 9 p.m., out of which came an agreement where North Korea agrees to completely denuclearize. Now, I'm not saying I trust North Korea. But the mere fact that Donald Trump in the United States of America got North Korea to the table, shaking hands. Trump, by the way, is to be commended. Yes, I believe he deserves a Nobel Prize. Now, you guys know I'm a fan of the president, but I've never been a cheerleader of the president. When he's wrong, I call him out. There are people in his administration that I still think and then have thought shouldn't be there. <clears throat> his son-in-law, his daughter, I never liked that idea. There are some other people that I would have liked to have never seen been in the administration. Reince Priebus, Katie Walsh, his uh, prior chief of staff and, and deputy chief of staff. But there is no debating the fact that Donald Trump knows how to make a deal. And there's no debating the fact that he is completely, completely dismantling Barack Obama and the Republican neocons, the, the Democrats' globalist agenda. There is no doubt. Let's look at the, the, the pre-meeting, if you will. Much has been written in the media about the meeting itself. Now, the details of the denuclearization deal are pretty scant right now. We don't have many details. We know that there are certain concessions, the most important of which, of course, is that North Korea is going to denuke. Others are that we're going to get the remains of 6,000 service people from the Korean War. That's a big deal for those families. A very big deal for the children and the grandchildren of those who fought, fought in that war. Uh, many of them are, you know, alive. Many of those families, their children would be in their 60s and 70s, their grandchildren in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So these are relatively young families that'll now get some closure of, uh, for a deceased relative, which I think is a spectacular, spectacular thing. I've told you on this show many times, there is no more powerful weapon on this planet. I don't care about the, how many kilotons of nuke is. Couldn't care less. There is no more powerful weapon on this planet to destroy communism, dictatorships, totalitarianism. No greater weapon than capitalism. None. So, of course, the left-wing media is hysterical about the way Donald Trump handled the meeting. But let's first go to the pre-meeting. Trump, Pompeo, and National Security Advisor John Bolton pulled off, Bolton pulled off a work of art. I'm suspecting, although she was uh, less visible, for obvious reasons, the new CIA director, Gina Haspel, had a lot to do with this as well. Not to mention Secretary James Mattis over the Department of Defense. Many, many people. Uh, General Kelly, the chief of staff, had input here. Tremendous input into this. The president is his chief of staff, but there's also a Marine four-star general who has tremendous experience around the world. Now, Trump commanded this meeting from day one. First, by sending Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to meet with Kim twice, an underling. I am the biggest fan of Secretary of State Pompeo, so I don't say underling in a demeaning way whatsoever. I think he might go down in history as one of the greatest secretaries of state. This man has accomplished more in months than his predecessors of many administrations have in decades. So I, but, but he's clearly in the chain of command, subordinate to the president. And so that sent a message to Kim that the president was going to send an emissary twice to feel things out. Then the minute Kim stepped out of line, the president walked from the summit. Kim then sent an emissary with a big card to the White House. The summit was back on. The summit took place as scheduled. Something I've actually been predicting at a better than 50% chance. Now, yesterday I predicted that we'd come out of this with a win. I didn't know it was going to be this big of a win, but I predicted we'd come out of it with a win because I suspect that the groundwork was already laid. I didn't think Donald Trump was going into this blind. I think a lot of the work was done by Secretary Pompeo and through the intermediaries. But the fact that Trump handled it that way, the fact that he handled it that way, showed us something else. It showed us that the uh, United States controlled this from start to finish. The United States was in complete control here, complete command and control. 
even the way Trump exited the meeting for a couple of days, it forced North Korea to take a submissive posture and go back to the White House with that letter. Then we get to the meeting itself in Singapore. If you look at the nuances of the body language, Trump escorting Kim in, Trump commanding the room. When they shook hands and looked at the camera, Trump giving Kim a nod. It's okay, now you can talk to the cameras. He controlled it. Those little subtle cues. Kim was looking to Trump to figure out when it was time to do the next thing. There was already, there was already a, a superior subordinate relationship there with the United States in the position it should have been, superior. Superior. Not subordinate, like Barack Obama was with Cuba. Those embarrassing, embarrassing photographs of Raul Castro holding Obama's limp wrist over his head. In contrast, the Trump, six foot three, six foot four, standing there, shaking Kim's hand firmly, looking down at Kim. That's what the United States needs. I'm not saying height. Right, that's something you're born with. Obama was much taller than Raul Castro. He's about a foot taller than Raul Castro. Raul Castro still made Obama look weak, feckless, a weak, silly. It was such an embarrassing visual for the United States of America. But Trump goes into this meeting and he gets out of the meeting what he expected to get going in. Trump never sold, despite what the left-wing media tells you, Trump never sold the American people on anything remotely resembling him uh, having come out of that meeting with North Korea demolishing all its nuclear sites while they were in the meeting. He always said we're going to get to an agreement where they'll denuclearize, which we did, and we're going to create an inspection framework, and then we're going to move forward. And we're going to get some other things as well. The left was hysterical. People like Jim Acosta saying, well, Trump gave himself all kinds of outs if it doesn't work. These people are so unpatriotic. So unpatriotic, it's sickening. Then the left-wing media was hysterical because what came out of this was that Trump showed Kim a North Korean coastline on an iPad. And he said, what beautiful beaches. Wouldn't it be great if you had hotels and resorts? So, of course, the left said, oh, this is all about personal enrichment for Trump. A, so what? And B, it's brilliant. I don't care if it's Marriott, Ritz-Carlton, Hyatt, Hilton, or the Trump organization that builds hotels there. Capitalism creeping in is only a good thing. Only a good thing. The left is hysterical for no reason. It was brilliant. A stroke of brilliance for Donald Trump to show Kim a developed coastline. Kim is infatuated with the West. He's infatuated with wealth. It was one of the, one of the, one of the best, uh, one of the best exercises in asymmetrical diplomacy I've ever seen. Really important stuff. I want to stay on this North Korea story for you. Help me do that by subscribing to our premium service at www.therebel.media forward slash shows. Go to the App Store, download the Rebel app. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.